The idea of humans and cartoons existing in the same world is one that has persisted for decades. From kids interacting with animated serial mascots, to music videos showing the crossover between dimensions, there has been no shortage of stories that attempt to meld the two realities. But the one that set the still unmatched standard is 1988's Who Framed Roger Rabbit? A movie about a cartoon rabbit named Roger who lives in the real world and is framed for murder is helped by a human detective to clear his name. It's a legendary film, not only loved by audiences, as evidenced by its earning over $350 million worldwide, more than seven times its budget, but adored by critics as well, with more than 40 award nominations to its name, including receiving four Academy Awards, all while bringing together the most famous cartoon characters of all time and creating a few new ones in the process. With Roger Rabbit a success, a bright future for Disney's newest star seemed to be a given. But instead, Roger has gone from the lead in one of the most revolutionary animated projects to total obscurity. There's not one simple answer as to why this is, but through tracking the property through the years post-film, we may have a better understanding as to what it was that led to his absence. We'll look at the other movies he was in, the sequels that never were, and the potential character-related reasons he, and his wife Jessica for that matter, haven't been seen since. Let's work to solve the mystery of what killed Roger Rabbit. To understand the circumstances that precipitated Roger's absence, it's important to know the context of the characters themselves, starting with a brief history of who Roger and Jessica are and how they came to be. Roger Rabbit debuted in Gary Wolf's 1981 novel, Who Censored Roger Rabbit? Disney would purchase the movie rights to the story, and with the plot reworked and the title changed, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? would release in June of 1988 to worldwide fanfare. Roger himself is incredibly distinctive when it comes to his appearance and personality. Dressed in red overalls and a polka dotted bow tie, with yellow gloves against his white fur that accentuate his skeletal looking arms, his design is more in line with Emmett Kelly's sad hobo clown rather than any of Disney's previous marketable cherub faced leads. In the film, his situation is dire. Framed for murder and faced with the possibility of his wife's infidelity, it's a stressful situation that puts him through the emotional ringer. He's frightened, inconsolable, overwrought with anxiety, and he lets anyone within earshot know about it, with his shrill squeals and stuttering pleas, only interrupting his own moments of nervous energy when he sees the opportunity for a well-timed gag. He may come off as unbearable in the movie, but it's by design, fulfilling his in-universe and in-reality purpose to be funny. It may not always look or sound pretty, but he does it better than anyone. On the opposite end of the spectrum is Roger's wife, Jessica Rabbit, one of the most recognizable cartoon characters ever. With her shapely body that would make an hourglass blush, she's the be-all end-all when it comes to animated vixens. Her hair covering more of her face than her sparkling dark pink dress does of her own body, her look is iconic to the point that the term of having a Jessica Rabbit body type is now a widely understood turn of phrase to describe a woman with a curvaceous physique. She's a singer at the Ink and Paint Club, but her alluring show is a facade for her true nature. A determined woman fiercely loyal to her husband and more than well equipped to do whatever it takes to see his name cleared. Roger may be the title star, but it's actually Jessica that's the most famous of the two. The results of Who Framed Roger Rabbit being a commercial hit would immediately begin the process of springboarding the bunny into a bigger spotlight. Later that year, Roger would get his own mascot costume at Disneyland, and he would also co-star in the NBC made-for-television special Mickey's 60th Birthday. For a brand new character to go from having a starring role in a history-making movie to a nationally broadcast celebration for the most famous name in cartoons, is pretty significant. The special itself is an extended look back at the history of Mickey through the years, connected by a loose story. Mickey, in an effort to give the audience at his birthday a show they'll never forget, 
uses the Fantasia Sorcerer's hat to cast magic. The Sorcerer doesn't appreciate Mickey using the hat's magic, and casts a spell so no one will recognize the mouse. And the remainder of the runtime finds Mickey interacting with different popular TV show characters on his way back to Disneyland, trying to discover his own magic in the process. The special is noteworthy for two reasons. It was the first instance of Roger appearing outside of his own movie, and the entire thing was done with animated versions of Roger and Mickey engaging with humans in the real world, a la Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The animation here isn't given as much detail as the movie, which is understandable, but it still looks good. Roger maintains his scatterbrained persona, bumbling around and being the first domino in the inciting incident. What the special proves to be more than anything, is the one thing Roger does better than any other of Disney's wide array of characters. He's able to coexist with humans and toons alike, which may seem unremarkable, but that may in fact be his greatest attribute. For comparison's sake, both Roger and Mickey have their own reactions to other cartoon characters, but when it comes to real life people, Mickey only ever has widely positive dealings with them. It's understandable, he's the company's mascot and has to uphold his amiable image, but it doesn't make for the most interesting scenes of socializing. With Roger, he acts the same no matter who he's with. It's an underappreciated aspect of his character that goes unheralded and may be his greatest quality as a character. The year of excitement for Roger would culminate in a big way, with him getting his own live show during that Christmas at Disneyland, a fitting end to a big first year. Momentum would then carry into 1989 with discussions of a prequel movie titled Roger Rabbit, The Toon Platoon, which would find the pre-Hollywood Roger enlisting in the army during World War II and rescuing his future wife Jessica from behind German enemy lines. It's an ambitious plotline that I would be endlessly curious to see how it would have been executed. As this idea was bandied around, a series of mostly animated short movies were produced starring Roger and Baby Herman, in the same vein as the original movie's opening short, with the intention of keeping Roger in the public eye. A total of three were released, roughly under seven minutes each, with the original voice actors returning for their respective parts. The shorts would be shown before other Disney theatrical releases, but the question is, how were these other Roger Rabbit movies? Premiering before 1989's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids was the debut short, Tummy Trouble. The shorts all start out the same way as the original. With the enlarging faces and maroon cartoon logo, it's a nice way to pay homage to the movie this all started from. I also love the picturesque title cards. They always felt like such beautiful pieces of art. When it starts, we get the return of the faceless woman, a fun nod to the old Tom and Jerry style characters as she says goodbye to baby Herman and that Roger will be babysitting. It's funny that she asks Roger to look over baby Herman. You could argue if that were the case for a dog or cat character, it would make sense since they were the house pet. But what is Roger in this world? A clothed pet rabbit? She calls him Uncle Roger? So is he a somewhat equal human figure since they do speak with each other? It's something that will never be answered, nor does it need to be. We also get a very quick look into who Roger is, as he's caught trying to go through her purse. It's not in a totally malicious way like he's a thief, but more like a child looking for candy. It's a subtle moment that shows who he is when no one's looking. To calm the crying baby down, Roger gives him a rattle, which he promptly swallows. Roger, of course in hysterics, calls for an ambulance to take Herman to the hospital. And the ambulance has eyes and a mouth too, like Benny the Cab from the movie, which is a nice bit of consistency there with the vehicles. Roger goes to visit baby Herman's hospital room, and on the walls, there's some curious pictures. One shows the skeletal anatomy of a mouse's skull, and there's a changing screen with mouse pants and shoes thrown over it, and a bag of money on a scale, which I'm assuming is alluding to underneath the ears and gloves is a dominating corporation. It's so quick, but pretty impactful, and of course, funny. Roger ends up burping the rattle out of baby Herman, but subsequently swallows the rattle himself. Hearing the rattling sound, the doctors come and take Roger away to operate on. 
Down the hall, we get a Jessica Rabbit sighting. Dressed as a nurse pushing baby bottles down the corridor, it's a creative way to insert her into the short without feeling like she's being shoehorned in. After an explosive action sequence, Roger ends with the rattle in hand, but flabbergasted by the medical bill. The true ending, however, is when the studio shoot ends with the live action crew ending production and Roger going home with Jessica. It's more of the Roger that we've come to love. It's funny, the animation is great, and Roger's a very captivating character. And his dynamic with baby Herman, especially knowing their offstage selves, makes it all the more entertaining. The only dip from the movies to this short is that at some points, there's a noticeable drop in quality of animation. The few glaring examples being Roger falling through the floors, riding in the wheelchair, and the ending mixed with the live action segment. And the rest of it looks phenomenal, in no short part played by its hugely dedicated undertaking, which included 75 animators among the other staff, leading it to it being the most expensive cartoon short ever made by Disney at that point. The next short would play before 1990's Dick Tracy, titled Roller Coaster Rabbit. It begins with Roger pushing baby Herman in his baby bassinet at a fair, the faceless woman telling Roger that Herman is too little for rides and that she's going to get her palm red. Roger pleads with her not to leave him alone with baby Herman, which is such a stark contrast to the eager servitude other cartoon characters would emit in that position. Roger knows what happens when he watches Herman, and he's begging her not to put him through that surefire pain again. And how quickly it seems to start, with Herman letting go of his red balloon, but Roger quickly grabs it and ties the string in a knot to the carriage handle. Or so he thinks, as he ties his fingers to it instead. Good old fashioned wacky cartoon goodness. The rest of the short follows baby Herman's pursuit of his red balloon with Roger in tow, the theme park becoming less fun for Roger with every attraction, getting hit in the head with darts, caught in the ferris wheel. Roger and Herman find themselves on a roller coaster and they get a lot of comedic mileage from here. Roger, holding baby Herman, narrowly dodges a sign that says, don't stand up. And when he dodges it and smugly looks back, he's smacked in the face by the next sign that says, we mean it. They also go out of bounds at the film strip and Jessica Rabbit makes her next appearance as a damsel tied up on the tracks who asks Roger for help. When he can't hear her, she surprisingly snarls and yells at him to help her. But it's a dimension of her that isn't tapped into very often, so it's exciting to see. The movie ends up with Roger messing up the film and running through the production's ending card. After this short, another major development for Roger was introduced. In January of 1993, we got the opening of Mickey's Toontown, a whole section of Disneyland with the Roger Rabbit theme. And later that year would be the last Roger Rabbit short, Trail Mix-Up, which was shown before the 1993 theatrical release of A Far Off Place. It starts with, in my opinion, the most beautiful background by far of all the shorts. It goes back to the days of Snow White and Bambi, just bright and beautiful. The trio of Roger, Herman, and the Faceless Woman arrive at the campsite, Roger tripping on a pine cone, and the pack of everything he's carrying falling neatly into place. Cartoon logic at its best. She plans on going hunting, and tells him he has to watch baby Herman, and that his shenanigans had better come to an end as she brandishes a knife. Which is so funny how she's done putting up with Roger to this extreme level. Roger decides to make a fire for him and baby Herman, and takes out a violin, tossing it and using the bow to rub two sticks together, which is such a creatively funny way to get to that point. As Roger warns baby Herman not to sit too close to the fire so he doesn't burn his weenie, the ranger comes by to check on them, and it's who else but Jessica Rabbit. We get to see a side of Roger that hasn't been explored much, and it's his attraction to Jessica. As she stands over him, the pace of his friction increasing while he salivates over her, before bursting into flame and a puff of smoke, it's a great wink of an adult joke, but we haven't really seen Roger fawn over her. He obviously loves her from his deranged pursuit of her in the movie, but this is one of the only times we see him act as daffy as others have over her. 
The rest of the short is filled with more fun as Roger chases baby Herman around the woods, where they bump into a beaver and a bear, before careening off a waterfall, plugging up the old predictable geyser, and launching them into Mount Rushmore, which is so fun to see a physical model being blown up, before Roger stakes a makeshift flagpole into the ground, deflating the earth. The third movie makes three for three of enjoyable shorts. They're in varied environments, but the levels of humor and dangerous situations they find themselves in feel as fresh and new as ever. Unfortunately, the plan for other additional shorts wouldn't go as followed, as the rest would be canceled or go on unproduced. The rest of the 90s found to be the beginning of the end for Roger, starting with Steven Spielberg bowing out of the Roger Rabbit Toon Platoon idea after finding himself unable to, quote, satirize Nazis after directing 1994's Schindler's List. 1997 would find a new version of a prequel written, this time about Roger's journey of becoming a movie star. Test footage was shot the year after using CGI, but with the high cost and less than pleasing look, any further work down that road would be discontinued. The 2000s and 2010s saw rumors of Roger's return in varying capacities. In 2013, the writer of the original Who Censored Roger Rabbit story pitched a script that saw Mickey Mouse and Roger together in a prequel to Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which included the tale of how Roger and Jessica met. And 2014 would end any possibilities of the original duo of Roger and Detective Eddie Valiant reuniting, with actor Bob Hoskins passing away. And in 2016, director Robert Zemeckis stated that the next proposed chapter in Roger Rabbit would move from the 1940s to the 1950s, and Eddie Valiant would return in ghost form. To date, there have been no updates on any of these proposed sequels. Roger has appeared sparingly in minor cameos throughout the decades, but what is it that's keeping him from coming back? The obvious answer would be that there hasn't been a sufficient script and the advancement of technology has changed the way a second movie would be made. And those are both viable reasons. While scripts that have been lauded as worthy of being the next film have been passed around Disney Studios for what seems like years now, the awe that audiences once held for 2D animation has been gone for quite some time. The option to make a partially 3D animated film is on the table, but maybe since we've seen the lifelike intermixing of realities before, it would have to be something equally or more revolutionary to make me feel like this new effort would be justified. What I believe the honest explanation for Roger's disappearance is, is that he's not the kind of character Disney wants to promote. He's a goofy, childlike sad sack who has been out of the spotlight for decades. And with nothing new in the pipeline, where do you go? Do you start him out again in animated shorts first? give him a bigger appearance in Disneyland, put out a full-on reboot? There are lots of possibilities, but with Roger, it's a daunting choice figuring out which one to select. And with Roger comes the inevitable topic of Jessica, who based on her aesthetic alone, would almost have no chance of reappearing in the same form as she once did with how society and companies at large have changed in dealing with perceptions regarding outward appearances. Which is ironic, seeing that the essence of her character was not to judge her outwardly, but by who she is as a person. For further proof, look at her appearance in Disneyland's Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin ride. She no longer dons her pink dress, and is now covered head to toe in a Dick Tracy-esque trench coat. Disney's reasoning is they wanted to update the plot of the ride to make Jessica go from a kidnap victim into a private detective following in the footsteps of Eddie Valiant, which is an idea I genuinely like, and I'm a fan of the new outfit. But if they wanted to communicate Jessica being a detective, they could have kept her in the same dress carrying a giant magnifying glass. This isn't a debate topic as to whether or not Jessica should or shouldn't be dressed up any more or less. She could have been removed from the ride altogether, but with her so connected to the Roger Rabbit franchise, they may have been forced to keep her in this instance. And if they can avoid having to acknowledge her in any major way going forward, that might be the direction they choose to go.
Roger Rabbit's plan for world domination certainly hasn't gone as anticipated. With nothing planned, and the opportunity for gathering the original crew for one last ride dwindling with each passing year, the future is uncertain at best. The funniest part is that it may not be the worst option for the preservation of the original's legacy. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is one of the most memorable films of all time. Being entered in 2016 into the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress, which recognizes culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant films. Who Framed Roger Rabbit may have been that perfect first attempt that just can't be followed up. Anything other than a more perfect sequel will be scrutinized by comparison, fair or not. And if that's the reason we never see him in another major movie again, that's the highest compliment anyone could ever hope to wish for.